Hello and welcome back to MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic. In today's video, we are going to add the first 20 creature cards to our Momir Vig Cube with converted mana costs of 7. <laughs> What's up, MTGBC? That is the MTG Burgeoning Community. Welcome to the seventh installment of our ongoing Momir Vig Cube series. If you are unfamiliar with the scope and vision of this channel's cube, please look in the description below and click on the link for MTG Burgeoning's introduction to the Momir Vig variant. Go check out that video and then come right back because we are going to install the first 20 creatures with CMC of seven. Additionally, if you'd like to click the link in the description below labeled Cube Cobra, you can check out the contents of the cube right now. All right, with that being said, let's get to the creatures. We've got 20 to talk about today and they all have a mana value of seven. So let's begin with the Abhorrent Overlord, a 6-6 flyer that when it ETBs, we create a number of 1-1 black harpy creature tokens with flying equal to our devotion to black. So minimally, this is going to come down as a 6-6 six, six flyer and create two bat tokens. And the bats have flying, so that's going to give us some additional evasion. If we are fortunate enough to have any other black creatures under our control, then that will just make the creation of the bat tokens even better. Creatures that can create other creatures with any kind of abilities are prioritized in a variant like Momir Vig because we can only cast one creature per turn. As a drawback, at the beginning of our upkeep, we have to sacrifice a creature. So we do have the bats, and hopefully they will be plentiful. Abhorrent Overlord, you are card number one in this Momir Vig CMC7 section. Number two, we have the Aether Squall Ancient, a 6-6 six, six flying leviathan, that at the beginning of our upkeep, we get three energy. That's right, folks, we got mad energy creatures in this cube. We can pay seven energy and return all other creatures to their owner's hand. We can only activate this anytime we could cast a sorcery. This can be devastating because each creature in the Momir cube that comes into play is a token copy of the creature. So when a token leaves the battlefield, it ceases to exist. So if we pay the seven man, or if we pay the seven energy, and all creatures other than Aether Squall Ancient are returned to their owner's hand, they will no longer exist. So Aether Squall Ancient in the seven spot could be devastating. Creature number three, we have a Chroma Vision of Ixidor, a 6-6 six, six, flying, first striking, vigilance trampler. And it says at the beginning of each combat, please note that's not just our combat, that's the beginning of every combat. Each other creature we control gets plus one, plus one if it has flying, plus one, plus one if it has first strike, and so on for double strike, death touch, haste, hexproof, indestructible, lifelink, menace, protection, reach, trample, vigilance, and partner. So a Chroma Vision of Ixidor, we can easily consider this to be a finisher in this Momir Vig cube. Creature number four and our first artifact creature of this installment, and it is the Altar Golem. It's a trampler. Its power and toughness are equal to the number of creatures in play. It doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. We have to tap five untapped creatures we control to untap Altar Golem. So we do have the ability to have a big old trampling creature that can attack just once and just leave them tapped forever. Or we have a very big ground blocker. Either way, this is a great time to point out not every creature in this cube is going to be uber helpful or overpowered. All right, creature number five, we have the Ancestors Chosen. 4-4 four, four, First Strike, that when it enters the battlefield, we gain one life for each card in our graveyard. If everything goes according to plan and we're playing a land and casting a spell nearly every turn, then we can hope to gain six, seven, maybe five, eight life, somewhere around there, depending on what happens during the game. So a 4-4 four, four First Strike for seven is not great on the face of it. Bumping up the life total in a variant that only starts off with 24, that may prove to be more valuable than it seems. 
creature number six in our first red card of this installment, we have Ancient Hellkite, a 6-6 six, six flyer that has a fire-breathing-like ability. Come on, camera, get in the game here. There we go. All right, we tap a red, and Ancient Hellkite deals one damage to target creature defending player controls. We can only activate this ability if Ancient Hellkite is attacking. So, MTGBC, load up your land decks with those mountains, because if we send this big flyer into action and our opponent does not have the requisite creatures to either block or destroy our Ancient Hellkite, then we can start picking off their dorks left and right as long as we have the red mana to do so. All right, card number seven, we have Ancient Ooze. Its power and toughness are each equal to the total converted mana cost of other creatures we control. So that could be a ridiculously big creature. All it's lacking is a little bit of evasion. Thank goodness we have so many creature cards in the cube that would be more than happy to grant that evasion. Creature card number eight, we have the Angelic Arbiter. It's a 5-6 flyer. Each opponent who casts a spell this turn cannot attack with creatures. Each opponent who attack with creatures this turn can't cast spells. So what are you going to do? Are you going to cast that creature and not attack? Or are you going to attack and not cast a creature? Angelic Arbiter will put you in a tough situation and make your decision-making process... A little more difficult. All right, we are at the almost halfway point here, and we're staying with Angels. We're going to go with the Angel of Retribution, a 5-5 flyer with first strike. That's it. Nothing more. No massive walls of text. Just a 5-5 beater. All right, num card number 10 as we near the halfway point, and now are at the halfway point of this video. We have Angel of Serenity, a 5-6 flyer that when it ETBs, we may exile up to three other target creatures from the battlefield. We're going to stop right there because there will be no creature cards in graveyards. And it also reads that when Angel of Serenity it leaves the battlefield, return the exile cards to their owner's hands. We will not be doing that because, as we stated earlier, the creatures are tokens. So once Angel of Serenity ETBs and exiles three creatures, most likely our opponent's creatures from the battlefield, those creatures will cease to exist. Angel of Serenity can really tip the scales in our favor. All right, creature number 11, and we are going straight turtle power here, baby. Angler Turtle, 5-7 hexproof. Creatures your opponents control attack each combat if able. That could be a good thing. That could be a not-so-good thing. But like we've echoed before, not every card in the cube is going to be uber-helpful. All right, creature number 12, we have Angrass Marauders. This will get the game moving in a hurry. If a source we control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. Consider this our own personalized Furnace of Wrath. All right, creature lucky, lucky creature number 13 is the Arbiter of Null Ridge, a 5-5 Vigilant Giant Wizard. When it ETBs, each player's life total becomes the highest life total among all players. So we're getting a 5-5 Vigilant creature, but we're also having every other opponent move up to the life total of the highest at the table. Again, not every card in the cube is going to be a Jim Dandy. Next up, we have an Arcbound Lancer. It's a first strike artifact creature with modular four, so it's going to come down with four plus one plus one counters, and when it hits the graveyard, it can move those plus one plus one counters onto another artifact creature. Hopefully, if you're playing with the Arcbound Lancer, you got another artifact creature on the battlefield to take advantage of the modular ability. All right, creature number 15, as we hit the three-quarter mark of this video, we have a classic Archangel. 5-5 five, five flying, attacking doesn't cause Archangel to tap. Of course, this was before that was named Vigilance. All right, next creature up. Sticking with those angels, baby. We have the Archangel of Strife. 6-6 six, six flyer. When it ETs bees, each player chooses war or peace. Creatures controlled by players who chose war get plus 3, plus 0. Creatures controlled by players who chose peace get plus zero, plus three. This can really change up the battlefield dynamic because if anyone who is really 
you know, taking control of the game can make their creatures even more threatening. And anyone who's behind could give the additional power or toughness boost to their creature, to their creatures as a way in which to catch up or to try to pull further ahead. All right, next we have, um, ooh, yeah, here we go. We have Arc, e Arc, Arc Demon of Unks. Arc Demon of Unks. It's a 6 6 flying trampler. At the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice a non zombie creature. Then put a 2 2 black zombie creature token into play. So at some point in time, this is going to end up becoming detrimental as long as the creatures that we are sacrificing are not as strong as a 2 2 zombie creature. And again, like I said a couple of times already, just in this installment alone, not every creature is going to be uber helpful or powerful. Worst case scenario, we can just sacrifice Archeman of Unks at the beginning of our upkeep the turn after we summon it. All right, three creatures remain, and we're staying with our Arc Fiends because that's how we roll at MTG Burgeoning. We have Arc Fiend of Sorrows. Come on, camera. There we go. A 4-5 flyer that when it ETBs, creatures your opponents control get minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. That's going to be a pretty powerful board wipe, particularly if we have any opponents that are really amassed a sizable army of utility creatures. We're not going to pay much attention to the unearth mechanic of this card, because when a token creature such as this and every other creature in the Momir Big Cube leaves the battlefield, it ceases to exist. Creature number 19, and our third straight arc, we have Arc Fiend of Spites. 6-6 six, six Flyer, whenever a source an opponent controls deals damage to Arc, Field of, arc, sorry, arc Fiend of Spite, that source's controller loses that much life unless they sacrifice that many permanents. This is the ultimate combat deterrent. 6-6 six, six Flyer, so it can block a whole host of different creatures. And unless an opponent is ready to sacrifice those many permanents, or lose that much life, well, Arc Fiend Spite is going to really thwart the combat hopes and dreams of so many opponents at the Momir Vig table. All right, MTGBC, we come to card number 20 of the seventh installment of the Momir Vig Cube, and it is the Archon of the Triumphrates. Four five flyer, when it ETBs, Detain up to two target non-land permanents your opponents control. Think about that for a moment. In a variant like Momir Vig, where the creatures are the bloodline, that is the only way to win. You're going to win via combat. To have an Archon of Triumph for it come down and take away two creatures for an entire round of turns, whether it's one opponent or stretched across two different opponents, that could be absolutely backbreaking in a variant that prioritizes and needs combat to find victory. Archon of the Triumphant is going to be a potential game-winning card to summon from our cube. And there you have it, MTGBC. We are 140 cards deep into our Momir Vig cube. This is MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic.